that if we find a few more identical molecules in cannabis, then we can stop calling it a medicine and call it a supplement. <laughs> <laughs> question about a specific treatment um, of cannabis. Um, I became an advocate of it when my 15-year-old son, who had severe ADD, started smoking pot. And I was asking him, how come you're suddenly getting AIDS? And, and it was pretty amazing. It was pretty dramatic. And he told me it helped him focus. It helped him identify how he learned. Of course, he got arrested for that. He got into trouble. He got kicked out of school. And his psychiatrist, who I went to, put him on Marinol, which basically helped him pass the drug test, and told me to cook for him. I cooked for him. He's now a senior at Arizona State studying astrobiology. I spoke with Dr. Russo in Missoula about ADD, and there's no literature out there about the treatment of ADD, and I wonder what does cannabis do to the brain that helps ADD? Because it's so much better than Ritalin. It just fixes it. Just fixes it. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, I'll come back and finish answering Talon's question, because I didn't do it. I'm not aware of, of any studies that show specific neuroanatomical or neurochemical abnormalities in the brain of people who use marijuana other than some very early studies. And again, you know, for all of you who've listened to me talk, I'm repeating myself so you can all go to sleep right now. <laughs> the early studies done on marijuana tell us more about the contaminants that found their way into the, into the, the sources of marijuana. I mean, Low quality cannabis came across the border from Mexico and Central America and it was doctored with anything and everything that would make people feel stupid or euphoric or anything else, so they'd buy more of it. So there's a fair amount of literature talking about aberrations in, in behavior and in um, physiology that reflects what contaminants do. Marijuana itself, once you, you get down to the pure organically produced herb, doesn't have a lot of adverse effects, period. Now, you've got some very recently published literature that's, that's beyond question in terms of methodology that suggests that if you use it in an adolescent brain, and I'll go out on a limb and, and tell you two things real quick. One, I'm persuaded that in adolescents and, and young adults, probably up to about 25, that there's a different impact of the whole plant on the brain. It, it, tends to bring about a different hierarchy of effects. And this is an observation based on the younger patients that I certify and the older patients that I certify. Okay? And, and their stories about what it did for them when they were younger and what it does for them now. But we certainly can look at data that tells us that the frontal lobe of the brain is still maturing through adolescence and into young adulthood. And that's real science, people. I mean, there is uh, enough information out there to tell you that you, you aren't the same in terms of how your brain works now as you were at 16. Thank God. <laughs> All right? Now, given that fact, I think you need, do need to know that we are presented with literature that suggests that we may be unmasking as opposed to causing psychosis, particularly schizophrenia in adolescents in heavy users. So all that, all that I can tell you right now is that if someone wants to use very current scientific information to, um, you know, to uh, denigrate the idea of using marijuana as medication in adolescence, they're going to pull up those studies um, and they're going to talk about them. But that, there's no proof of causality and all I want you to really realize is that, you know, uh, in adolescence, marijuana may be giving us, cannabis may be giving us a different profile of behavior. Now, specifically for ADD, I've got about 300 plus patients who tell me that cannabis is superior to anything else they've ever been given for ADD. And I don't think those 300 people are lying to me. So I'm fascinated by the fact that you have one end of the spectrum in conventional pharmaceuticals stimulants being used to change behavior in ADD patients 
and then you take cannabis, which I don't think most people in this room consider a stimulant, and yeah, it works for ADD. We need to know why. It's going to open some new doors, windows into understanding brain chemistry and brain physiology, but right now it's just anecdotal. That means it's observation. I don't know of any literature about it. This question is from Mr. Rosenfeld. Being a federal patient, uh, I don't know if they allow you cons to consume cannabis through other sources other than what they supply. Uh, I guess it's a two-part question. And if you can, I'd like to know if you sampled some Montana homegrown. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the federal government would prefer that I only ingest medical cannabis from the federal government because they know exactly what's in it. Where when you ingest something that you don't know what's in it, they cannot supposedly uh, reaffirm the study, which there's no study to begin with. <laughs> uh, right now, my last shipment, my shipment should have been in October 8th, my next shipment. It's not in. Now, the government sometimes, most of the time, uh, does that, delay tactics. And I will not be without my medicine, period. And so your question is, have I ever, have I tried any Montana's finest? Uh, let's put it this way. Uh, I've tried some of Montana's finest, not only just in Montana. <laughs> <laughs> and I, that's why I like to see individual growers, because individual growers are going to be more caring about their plants and about what they're trying to do. And it's almost like a connoisseur with wine. It's like, you know, look what I, look at the wine I just made. You've got to try some of mine. Well, I'll try some of yours, but you've got to try some of mine, you know. And that's the way it is, and that's the way it should be. That's the way you're going to keep the plant, and it's going to hopefully be enhanced. And that's how you're going to discover in, in the plants, you know, what's, what's beneficial and what's not. And I think that's why I've tried other different types of cannabis, because the government gives me a Mexican Jamaican blend that's a sativa. And it's, 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 it's cannabis sativa. It's not marijuana sativa. Well, it's not marijuana indica, it's cannabis indica. That's why we want to use the name cannabis. But again, the government will not research to find out what different cannabinoids work best for different disorders. Of the four federal patients, one is glaucoma, and one is me, a, a, neuro, a neurological painful disorder. It's hard for me to believe that the same cannabinoids work best for her or work best for me. So therefore, for, and while the government's not going to research this, I applaud the individual states for trying to do the research that the government's not. I just have a general question. What is the difference between uh, the cannabis that people are ingesting and Marinol? Because the argument always is, well, you can just take Marinol, you know, there's no need for... Marinol is an isolated form of just straight THC. It's just THC and none of the other constituents that you'll find evolving from the cannabis plants. So you're going to be emitting all the other 65 plus cannabinoids, you're also going to be omitting any terpenes or flavonoids, chlorophyll, any of the other potentially medicinal value uh, active agents in what would actually be the, the, the plant. And I believe there's even been um, a study since Marinol's evolution into the pharmaceutical world that has proven that Marinol is not close to as effective as uh, cannabinoids and the other medicine derived directly from the plant as a blend. And in fact, the blends that were I guess extracted from a direct cannabis plant put side by side with Marinol, which is just straight THC, showed that the Marinol was not even close to as effective as the uh, naturally derived blend of cannabinoids, flavonoids, terpenes, things like that. Is Marinol a synthetic? I believe I, I, I might be correct in this, but it is synthetic, I believe, but I also know that they have um, extracted it from a, I guess the substance I'm thinking of now is Sativex. Sativex is kind of the next step of Marinol, where, and I believe it's in clinical no, trials. No, 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 well, not stop. generations, probably stop. the wrong word. No, but. No, it's totally wrong. No, it's no, a whole extract. Sativex, sativex yes, is the sativex. entire plant. They're not, they're not extracted. I mean, it's it taking just a THC, and it's a pure THC extract. It's not. Well, yeah. Sativex is supposed to be the one to one CBD THC blend. That's so that's going to be one of them. That's yes. going to be, and that's the big. That's the big thing, that, and I, I may be corrected, I thought that they actually isolated the THC and CBD from the cannabis plant and then gave that in, in what they're actually using it as sprays, sublingual sprays for patients. And so the thought is that Marinol being just THC would not be nearly as effective as a blend of THC and CBD, two specific cannabinoids that have 
received a lot of research and are shown to be very medicinally active. Yeah. Well, okay, Sativex, which interestingly enough is uh, produced by a company um, for which Ethan Russo is, is currently the medical director. Ethan, Ethan is, uh, is intimately involved in, in helping to bring a whole plant extract to the market. And, um, it's available in Canada. By this time, it should have been approved, I think, in Spain and England. But, um, so, so, so basically, it's, it, it contains, as far as I know, all the cannabinoids, and the extraction is done with supercritical CO2, believe it or not. They take liquid carbon dioxide, and they use that as the solvent to extract the molecules, and then the CO2 just evaporates off. It's a phenomenal process. Um, but simply put, it's an entourage drug, meaning it, it is delivering a, a large number of the, bio, of the biologically active con, uh, cannabinoids. I don't even believe that the company, GW, that does Sativex has yet completed a, a survey of all of the cannabinoids. Okay? I think they're still looking for some of them. What? A long way away. So you're, you're dealing with a substance that, and, and I, I want to tell you very quickly, because we're hitting lunchtime and people are getting antsy and need to met. We have one more question. Okay, so let me make this one comment, okay, that, that in Canada, in Montreal, at uh, the Canadian Consortium for the Investigation of Can Cannabinoids about a month and a half ago, it was pointed out by two major pharmaceutical companies that their work uh, comprising more than 10 years and more than tens of millions of dollars have brought them nowhere in terms of bringing out therapeutic alternatives, single molecule alternatives based on active components of marijuana. So for all of the talk you hear about Big Pharma trying to replace marijuana, at the moment they don't have a tool, people. They may not be anxious to see what you're doing take over a a lucrative niche in the pharmaceutical industry, but they haven't got an alternative. That being said, that leads up to my question. Um, first, though, before I ask, I just want to thank you, you three gentlemen, and the Montana Medical Growers Association for being here today and giving your time today and um, the support that we're all looking for. I really appreciate it.